dear friends, just by chance, quietly in my chapel, I was reading the details of the great miracle linked with this gospel. Some of you actually may have already been there, but you all know about it. And the name is linked with this gospel. Lanciano is linked with the word for lance. And Longinus also may be linked with it, the name traditionally given to the soldier who pierced the sacred heart and was touched eventually by grace. And I think tradition has it that he became even a bishop later on. But it is only in our time, to be precise, it was coming through when I was in France in the 70s, news of what actually modern science had discovered. I'll leave you to swap that up if it is of interest to you, for every item is of interest, including the way that the laws of science are being juggled with on a daily basis. If one weighs the parts separately and so on, they weigh exactly the same as when they weighed together. In other words, we're out of nature as we know it. Just as in our local miracle at Siena, one is there before not something of the past, but every moment of time is a continuation of that miracle of the preservation of the hosts taken in 1730. Now, one item which has been discovered, amongst others, on this miracle, which happened around the 8th century, a Brazilian monk celebrating in the Western Rite, but with doubts in his heart. One of the details is precisely the fact that it is myocardial tissue that they have found. A person alive or just that moment dead, and so on. All the proteins, all the ingredients are there, except one. The one that has been found again in the miracle in Argentina, and when it was presented to the expert who had been responsible for the analysis of the one at Lanciano, without knowing where this other one came from, he exclaimed, El stesso uomo. It is the same man. Because this blood is perfect, but there's one crucial puzzling detail which is not regular. The DNA code is not there as in ordinary cases, which is actually an indirect proof of the virgin birth. Can you see why? Modern science coming not against faith, but to back it up. Now, the fact is that the Lord, in this miracle, is saying a lot in his utter silence. This indicates that what we have at the altar is the very heart of our God. Myocardial tissue means tissue from around the heart. Now that indicates that we are handling essential love. It has always been seen like that since the beginning of time. And indeed, at that first celebration of all, the Last Supper, we have St. John perhaps hearing the heartbeat of the Sacred Heart. The position of the soul in repose, as in human relationships, they can be arresting upon another person, whether spiritually or physically, we have the case, for instance, of St. Norbert, whose feast it was yesterday, who, in the biography we have from early on, it says that he rested on the soul of Evermode. St. Evermode was one of the early Primos Attention saints. And that expression has come down, resting on the soul of. In human relationships, it happens in spiritual friendship, we are given one soul to rest on as we travel dangerously through life. And if it's not there, if that element of someone there, you know what can go wrong. 
Just this morning, actually, I had a case again brought to me. A young person, a very young person, who's ended her life unexpectedly in her 20s. And that could be avoided if there was someone there on which to rest one's soul. And you could be that person. So listen to the pain that's coming from someone close to you. Pick up the signals in time. It was in some film, I think David Niven was on, in acting in it, and he muttered to his wife at one stage, there's no greater bliss than being married to one's best friend. So the ideal in that situation is to choose the person that you can share your heart with, and not just your body. And that precisely is what is missing in many a marriage nowadays. It's all except the soul that is shared. And when all that other stuff has gone and no longer is titillating, what is left? The Guinness, the goggle box, and everything except encounter. It's sad when the heart of the house is not actually in the house itself, but friends and mates are more important than the one that one has promised to love and cherish until death. And I would challenge you married people here, remember those vows. They're still heard on high every day of your life, to love and to cherish, till death us do part. That does actually mean what it says. You can't have parentheses of explosions in brackets not listened to from on high. All is heard from on high. And every state of life is to be examined on the specific areas of that state of life. The cenobitic monastic life, that is life together, has its own way of loving. And it's not easy either, because you're there in the same aquarium until death, and you know all the reactions of fish so-and-so next to you. And you have to avoid all the dangerous collisions. It's done with great expertise until death in one place. But it's the same but different in marriage. You're enclosed within your marriage until death. Work, therefore, on the quality of every single day. Why? Because if we are living love, if we are eating the living and loving God, and then permitting our tongue to wag away and to be used as a dagger, we are compartmentalizing our existence and thinking that God is not interested in certain sectors. I tell you, he's interested in every sector, even what happens in the hours of night. All is his. Now, I want to dwell on two things briefly. The first is the vertical. If we are consuming and encountering love, he is waiting for our love. Not just incense, not just words. Those are the expression of. And if what it is the expression of is not there, we're throwing sand in the eyes of our God and thinking we can get away with it. Worship is encounter, or it's an empty shell. And so, my friends, I would say, learn to meet love. That means resting, and it leads to my second point, the human heart. God cannot find rest in a troubled heart. Look at your heart. I remember when I was in Italy, the prior, by the way, I just saw on Monday again, he was in Ireland. He quoted the priest who was helping us when we were founding, because they were coming from France and not much Italian and not much knowledge of how they worked in Italy, especially in our area in Tuscany. And this good vicar general, who is now long dead, 
said to, this to our prior, the only priest at the time in the community, as regards these priests around here, sono tutti completamente ortodossi, they're all completely orthodox, ma non hanno alcuna vita interiore, but they have no interior life. Now, I'm just quoting that not to criticize or in any way belittle them because they're doing their work and very well. But it was an interesting remark coming from one of their number and it made me reflect what can actually happen even in the priesthood, that we can function very well. If that's the case in the priesthood, what about the lay people? Now, interiority means just that. It means that we have a whole vibrant life, unseen. Three things that make that well nigh impossible. One, exposure of the interior to unceasing noise and words. That is concrete. It means choosing silence. And it can be done. Two. The ability to switch off. Yes, switch off. And do as John did. Resting on the bosom of the Lord. Because if we can't do it, we're doing everything except the essential on our trip through life into eternity. Therefore, switching off from what can wait. Everything does not have to happen just right now. When perhaps right now might be richer from having that moment of gratuitous encounter and feeling. Which leads me to my third point, and it's a very important one in your case. All of you here, big time, into the things of the Lord. The holy fidget! The holy man or woman of God who thinks that the whole world depends on him or her, and has to do everything that crosses his or her mind. No! We filter the things that come into our mind and we discern, is this from myself, from the Holy Ghost, or even from some other source, and you know where I mean. Because life, my friends, sometimes is far more rich when fewer things are going on. And they're going on inside us if we have to have everything going on outsiders all the time. I just leave it with one trick. Learn how to close your eyes and look in. Just feel the presence in your soul, especially after the sacraments. You are just like that tabernacle a living temple of that presence. And he is hurting when he finds in his own that their mind is miles away, even for holy things, from the one thing that he wants. I just picked this up this morning. It's all the Lord is saying from the host and from the tabernacle and the Holy Communion from your heart. Love me. That means encounter me. Feel me. I just conclude with a reference to where we've come from. This actually was produced by somebody who's here right now. I mean, reproduced because we've gone to oblivion. But if one looks at what our ancestors here in Ireland did to be able to have what we have now, and the way that physically they approached it, one would see why the Sacred Heart is hurting in our time more than ever before. And it's not for no reason that all the pious households in Ireland had for centuries 
and still have this on the wall with the little lamp burning. That has been something which in every quiet Christian family in Ireland was a reminder all the time that what really matters is not the noise and the bustle, but the regard for which we came and where we go. So I leave you with that, my friends. Don't miss the point of this journey.